the scullery girl. Eliza held tight to her mother's hand as they walked through the wide, alien streets of the new town. There was so much space, she thought. Nothing like the crowded closers that branched off the high street and sloped down into the valley. That had been her world for the past ten years, living in a small, dimly lit ground floor house. A room would actually be a better way of describing it, which stank of fish oil from morning till night, as that was what they burned to produce light. Eliza's father had walked out on them four years ago, forcing her mother to work all day as a street seller, returning home just before it got dark. At the age of six, Eliza had been sent to the ragged school, but her mother had removed her when her father left, because she needed to look after the house. Money had become scarce, and Eliza was only eating one meal a day. So her mother had decided to put Eliza into service. After three weeks of searching, she had finally found a house on Charlotte Square that was looking for a scullery maid. This morning was the start of Eliza's first day. Her mother had tried to make her as presentable as possible and given her as big a breakfast as she could afford. Now, as they walked along George Street, Eliza goggled at the grand facades on either side of the street. Some of them were like the exterior to a palace. The pavements thronged with stately-looking people in their finery. They passed shop fronts with lettering emblazoned over the windows. Eliza was, uh, was not good at reading, and she could barely make head or tail of any of it. One shop front they had passed had an astounding display of bottles and funny-looking tubes. Eliza simply had to know what it was. It's an apothecary, said her mother. What's that? she asked. Well, do you remember when you were sick last month, and that nice gentleman gave me a bottle of medicine for you? That's where the medicine came from. Eliza nodded. She looked up at her mother's face. She was a small woman, and Eliza came up almost to her shoulder. Her mother smiled and squeezed her hand, but it was a forced smile. What does a scullery maid do? asked Eliza. I'm not sure, replied her mother. Are you scared? I don't know. Five minutes later they were standing on Charlotte Square, outside a magnificent looking house. We have to go down this way, sweetheart. Her mother had opened a gate in the railings, and was beginning to descend a narrow set of steps that led down into a small basement yard. Eliza followed her down. Under her arm she clutched a little bag made out of cheap sacking that contained a few personal items. Her mother rapped on the door with a brass knocker. It was presently opened by a large old woman with a grubby apron that was tied around her expensive waist. Her hair seemed to be tied up under a white frilly bonnet, and her plump cheeks were flushed with colour. She beamed at them. Good morning, madam, she chirped. She looked down at Eliza. And who have you brought here to help me? This is my daughter Eliza, said her mother. Good morning, Eliza. I am Mrs Scrimger, the cook. I'll be looking after you from now on. Well, at least for a while, anyway. Eliza gave her a shy smile and nodded. Mrs Scrimger addressed her mother again. Do you want to come in for a moment? I think so, just in case she gets her bearings. They followed the cook into a stone-flagged kitchen passage lit by candles and followed her along to the far end and into the kitchen, which smelled of freshly baked bread. A pile of burning coals flickered away in the range and a bird of some description sizzled on a revolving spit. There was a large wooden table in the centre of the room upon which were a pile of vegetables and a knife along with a scattering of plucked feathers. Eliza leaned her back against a sideboard with cupboards opposite the range. Above that were shelves crammed with pots and pans and funny-looking brass objects in different shapes. Another door led off into the scullery. Well, Eliza, what do you think? asked the cook. It's almost as big as my house, she said. Mrs Scrimger chuckled. This is mainly where you'll be working, along with me. You'll be my scullery maid. How about that? It's a big task. Do you think you can handle it? I don't know. What do I have to do? The cook chuckled again, her large bosom wobbling at the same time. You'll assist me in preparing meals for the family and servants, as well as doing any odd jobs that I need done. You'll cook and dress the meats, prepare the, and boil the vegetables, keep the kitchen utensils clean and ready for use, and clean the passageway. Your first task every morning will be to light the fire and heat the water for cooking and washing. 
Eliza stared at her aghast. I know, said Mrs. Scrimger gently. It's a lot of work. It'll take you a while to get you settled into things. It's a small household, you see. The lady of the house doesn't employ a, a large number. We have one butler, two housemaids, and three nursery maids. The Gilmores have four young children, two girls and two boys. Can I play with them? asked Eliza, her face brightening at the thought. But Mrs. Scrimger shook her head. I'm afraid that won't be possible. You have to stay downstairs with me. She hesitated. You won't be allowed upstairs, Eliza. Mr. Gilmore is very strict about that. It's not just you, the children have to stay in their nursery as well. Why? asked Eliza. That's just the way it is in this house. They couldn't, but her mother cut off. Eliza, you mustn't argue with Mrs. Scrimger. Eliza lowered her head. Sorry. No need to apologise, dear, said the cook cheerily. Come on, let's go and see where you'll be sleeping, shall we? She stretched out a large, chubby hand for Eliza to take, and led her back out into the passage. There were doors leading off the passageway, and the cook presently stopped in front of one of them and opened it up. Inside was a small room, with three low beds pushed close to each other against the left-hand wall. Against the wall opposite was a large wooden chest. You'll sleep in here with the housemaids, Jessie and Agnes. You'll like them. Jessie used to do your job. After showing her around the rest of the lower floor, Eliza's mother took her leave of them, after an emotional farewell, and Mrs. Scrimger gave Eliza a detailed tour of the kitchen. She explained what everything was and where it lived. The funny-shaped brass objects on the shelf turned out to be jelly moulds. Eliza screwed up her face. What's jelly? she asked. A soft and wobbly dessert. Sometimes it's sweet, sometimes it's savoury. Mr. Gilmer likes them for his dinner parties. He's having one in a few days, in fact, so you can help me make them. It was half an hour later, after Eliza had been given a little time to settle, that Mrs. Scrimger showed her into the scullery, where there was a pump and a sink. The sink was filled with warm, soapy water left over from washing. The cook placed a bucket under the sink and removed the plug, allowing the water to drain into the bucket below. She handed the bucket and a scrubbing brush to Eliza. Tuesday is the day for cleaning the kitchen and passage floors, she said. Mrs. Gilmore has a calendar where each part of the house is allotted a day for cleaning and dusting. Keeping the house clean is very important. It's an ongoing job, so every Tuesday you'll need to do this, OK? Eliza nodded. Mrs. Scrimger ruffled her hair. I'll also be giving you a uniform to wear, but don't worry about that just now. Eliza knelt on a piece of folded-up rag to protect her knees and scrubbed away at the stone floor while the cook tiptoed around her. She knew how to scrub a floor. She'd done it for her mother twice a week, along with constantly sweeping and dusting and cleaning her clothes. But this kitchen was the size of her mother's house put together, and not to mention the passageway, and she had never done any cooking. At three o'clock they began to prepare the servants' dinner. Eliza was given a basket full of potatoes and a pot of water. She was to scrub the potatoes and peel them, ready for boiling. The cook, meanwhile, was busy preparing a leg of ham. Do you like ham? asked Mrs. Scrimger. I think so. What animal's it from? The cook frowned at her. Good grief, child. Peg, of course. Do you mean to tell me you really didn't know that? Eliza shrugged. I was only at school for a year. Mrs. Scrimger shook her head and sighed. I'll have to have a word with Jessie. She's had an education. She can go over a few things with you. She watched Eliza scrubbing the dirt of a potato. It's very important to be educated, my dear. She carried the ham over to the range and placed it in a large pot of water before hanging it over the flames. At six o'clock the servants descended for their dinner, which was laid out in the servants' hall along the passage from the kitchen. Eliza had set the table for them and carried in the food, but Mrs. Scrimger took her to one side and said, I'm going to have to ask you to have your meal in the kitchen, dear. Another little rule of the household, I'm afraid. The scullery maid doesn't eat with the rest of the servants. So Eliza found herself sitting alone at the kitchen table with a pail of boiled ham and potatoes and listening to the chatter and laughter floating down the passage. Why couldn't she with the rest of the servants? seemed awfully unfair to her. She chewed on her ham and gazed up at the cooks on the ceiling where the ham leg had been. In front of her was a cup of mild ale that the cook had poured her. She sniffed at it cautiously before taking a little sip, 
It wasn't too bad, she decided. As it was only her first day, Mrs. Scrimger allowed her to go to bed early. When she went to her room, she found a little nightgown neatly folded up on her pillow. It was eight o'clock when she fell asleep. The other girls, Jessie and Agnes, had not retired yet. Nor had they when she awoke at ten o'clock, shivering and disorientated. It took her a moment to remember where she was. When she did remember, she sat up and drew her legs close to her chest. She listened for any sounds of activity, but there was nothing. She got up and went out into the passage, walking across the stone in her bare feet. The passage was deserted, but she could hear people now. A noise was coming from the floor above. She went to the foot of the stairs and looked up. A sense of extreme loneliness crept into her little heart. She wanted to be up there. She wanted somebody to speak to, but she knew she was not allowed. She sat down on the bottom step and started to cry. She wanted to go home. She wanted her mother. Just then, she heard a door open above her, and the noise increased in volume. She heard someone descending the stairs, and a moment later the butler appeared, whistling to himself. He stopped short when he saw Eliza. "'Oh, dear, oh, dear,' he said. Eliza looked up at him. "'The very picture of a damsel in distress.' He sat down next to her on the step. "'We were never actually introduced.' He extended a hand. "'I'm Mr. Cruikshank, the butler.' "'Eliza,' she whispered. "'Well, now, Eliza, I wonder if you might enjoy a tour of the wine cellar.' She sniffed and nodded. Mr. Cruikshank rose and headed for one of the doors leading off the kitchen passage. He reached into his pocket and produced a key. He gave her a sly wink. There's only one key to the wine cellar, and that belongs to me. The wine cellar consisted of a room slightly smaller than her new bedroom, with a vaulted ceiling and stone shelves set into the wall, with row upon row of bottles. On one side was wine, the other ale. Mr. Cruikshank took four of each. The wine cellar must be well stocked at all times, especially when Mr. Gilmore has company. Does Mr. Gilmore have company tonight? He does indeed. A Mr. Longmore and a Mr. Woodrow, two gentlemen from Aberdeen. What does Mr. Gilmore do? He's a landowner. He owns around 400 acres on the west coast as well as an, an estate in Aberdeenshire. What's an acre? It's a term for measuring amounts of land. How does he have so much money? asked Eliza. He inherited a lot of it. The rest he makes from rent money. The two gentlemen this evening are rent collectors from his estate. Mr. Cruikshank closed the cellar door and locked it again. Where's Mrs. Scrimger? asked Eliza. Mrs. Scrimger was invited to take tea in the drawing room with Mrs. Gilmore. Does she often do that? Not as often as she might like, but uh, more so than before. Mrs. Scrimger is leaving at the end of the month. She's been with the family for many years now. Eliza stared up at Mr. Cruikshank. Do you mean she's going to stop working here? Exactly. Her health isn't so good, and she's going to live with her daughter and son-in-law in Port Seaton. Then who will be the cook? There's a woman coming in to take her place. He paused at the foot of the stairs. I have to take these bottles up now. If I can, I'll tell Mrs. Scrimger to come and see you. He gave her another wink and headed up the stairs, once again whistling to himself. Mrs. Scrimger, once informed of her new scullery maid's condition, Julie excused herself from Mrs. Gilmore's company. Would you mind? Of course not, replied Mrs. Gilmore. I quite understand. May I take the spent tea leaves? I'll brew her a cup. Of course you may, replied Mrs. Gilmore. Mrs. Scrimger picked up the silver teapot on her way out, when Mrs. Gilmore suddenly stopped her. Wait. She crossed to the tea chest and opened it up, before extracting a teaspoon of fresh leaves and pouring them into an unused cup. Take this to her. Mrs. Gilmore, are you sure? asked the cook, frowning. Yes, you can bring the cup back when she's finished. Just don't tell my husband. Mrs. Scrimger smiled. I crossed my heart. A quarter of an hour later, she served the little girl a freshly brewed cup of tea at the kitchen table. Eliza took a sip and wrinkled her face. It's quite bitter, she complained. Mrs. Scrimger went over to a tall, cone-shaped mound that stood on the dresser. She picked up a pair of what looked like large pincers and cut off a couple of little chunks. Try a little sugar in it, she said. Mrs. Scrimger leaned on the table and stroked the little girl's hair. It'll get easier, she said. 
The next morning Eliza was up with the larks, as well as the rest of the house stuff. Mrs. Scrimger brought her her uniform, which consisted simply of a white dress that stretched to her ankles and a white bonnet. The minute she was dressed, she presented herself to Mrs. Scrimger in the kitchen for inspection. Oh, perfect, it fits fine, she said. The cook now showed her how to build up the fire high enough that the heat would power the fan in the chimney, which would turn the spit. She then asked Eliza to fetch a bucket of fresh water and pour it into a large pot to put over the fire. Breakfast was porridge and fresh bread. Eliza devoured both. Mrs. Scrimger smiled. I have to go on to the old town this morning, to the markets. I thought perhaps you'd like to come with me. The markets were teeming with people and animals. There was noise and bustle everywhere they turned. The air was filled with a hundred different odours. But this was Eliza's world, and she was happy here. She stayed close to Mrs. Scrimger as they moved through the crowd, and at one point had to hold on to her hand to stop herself being separated from the woman. What are we buying? she asked. Lots of vegetables, replied the cook. We also need six chickens, oysters, mutton, and several sides of beef, although the beef and mutton will be delivered to the house. I like oysters, said Eliza. As the cook was negotiating a price for her six chickens, Eliza wandered away from her and into the crowd. After pushing through several people, she found herself standing in front of a close she knew very well, her own. Borthwick's close was dark and smelly. Shadowy figures lurked in doorways at the foot of the close, where her mother always told her not to go. But during the day there was always so much activity, children playing on the cobbles, women hanging out their washing two floors up, or throwing out their waste, or making conversation with others. She was so close to home she could have walked down to her front door. But that was no longer her home. Mrs. Scrimger found her a moment later. Come on then, she said. Did you get the man to lower his price? asked Eliza as they made their way back. Mrs. Scrimger sighed. A little bit. It was quarter to nine when they arrived back at the house. Four very smartly dressed children were emerging from the main door. Those of Mr. and Mrs. Gilmore's children. Edward is the youngest, he's eight. Then there's Margaret, she's ten. The two eldest are Jemima and Michael, twelve and thirteen respectively. The children descended the steps with the two eldest at the front. Michael and Jemima didn't notice Eliza and the cook, but Edward and Margaret turned their heads and looked at them. They smiled at Mrs. Scrimger. Margaret nodded her head politely towards Eliza. When the vegetables had been deposited in the kitchen, they took the poultry and oysters out the back and down to an old outhouse just beyond the bottom of the garden. Beyond the outhouse was a driveway with a circular gravelled area at the top. That's the tradesman entrance, said Mrs. Scrimger. This is where the meat will be delivered later. Mrs. Scrimger unlocked the outhouse with a large bunch of keys. This is where the meat is stored, she said. Inside was a long, low slab of marble. Already laid out in it were several peasants and four or five rabbits. Mrs. Scrimger began laying out what they had just bought. The marble keeps the meat colder than normal stone would, she said. As they were making their way back to the house, Eliza glanced up at one of the windows. A gentleman was looking out at them. He was a stern-looking gentleman, with a broad face and dark hair that seemed to be flattened at the top of his head. A moment later he was gone. That was Mr. Gilmore, said the cook. Eliza was still looking towards the window. He looked a bit scary, she said. You just have to stay on the right side of him, replied Mrs. Scrimger. That afternoon, just after lunch, Mrs. Scrimger arranged for Jessie, the housemaid, to sit down with Eliza for half an hour and go over some simple grammar with her. They sat on Eliza's bed with a slate and a piece of chalk. Jessie soon discovered just how little Eliza could read, so she concentrated to begin with on short reading exercises. When the half hour was up, she said Eliza a little exercise she could do on her own, and told her they would go over it tomorrow. Eliza decided to go over it as she cleaned the copper with a large slice of lemon skin, dipped as Mrs. Scrimger had shown her in salt and silver sand. I am a... She paused. It was a big word she hadn't seen before. She stopped what she was doing and peered more closely at the word. Keep polishing, said Mrs. Scrimger. Eliza carried on. Can you spell it out to me? asked Mrs. Scrimger. 
S C U L L E R Y. Mrs. Scrimger smiled as she grinded a mixture of salt and herbs in the pestle. What do you think it might say? Eliza studied the word again. Suddenly her eyes widened. Scullery! she exclaimed. Eliza went to bed a little later than the night before. She was exhausted. She had brought a little rag doll with her, called Penny, which she now clutched in her hand beneath the bedclothes. As had happened the night before, she found herself awake again a few hours later. She lay there in the dark and heard the sound of gentle breathing from the beds next to her. Again she listened for any other sounds. At first there was nothing. The house was asleep. And then, all at once, she thought she heard a door open. It sounded like the door to the ground floor. A few moments later she sat bolt upright. She could hear children's voices whispering to each other in the passageway. Eliza threw back her covers. She tiptoed past the beds towards the door. Ever so gently, she turned the handle and walked out into the corridor. At the foot of the stairs were two children. Edward and Margaret stood frozen in the dim candlelight, their faces turned towards her in a mixture of fear and expectation. As soon as they saw her, they smiled and beckoned to her. Eliza enjoyed them. Hello, whispered Edward. We came looking for you. What's your name? Eliza. I'm Edward. This is my sister, Margaret. You're the new scullery maid, aren't you? Eliza nodded. Do you have to do a lot of work? Yes, replied Eliza. I have a lot of work to do at school. Margaret is lucky. She doesn't go to school. I can speak for myself, Edward. She turned to Eliza. He's just showing off, she whispered. I am not, hissed Edward. How did you get down here without getting caught? whispered Eliza. We quite often come down here at night, said Margaret. Our nursery maids never wake up. It's exciting. We're not usually allowed in the rest of the house, except the parlour. We have to stay in the nursery mostly. It's really boring. I have to stay down here, said Eliza. Have you met the witch yet? Eliza nearly stopped breathing. What? she hissed, her eyes wide. Well, the witch's ghost. She died many years ago. Her broomstick is still in the kitchen. No. Edward nodded. It's true. Mrs. Scrunger uses it to sweep the floor with. Eliza breathed in sharply. Apparently she comes back for it sometimes and flies around the new town, screaming and cackling. She's got a black cat as well, and it's still around, waiting for her to come back. From the grave, said Margaret. Eliza's eyes were as round as buttons now. How do you know this? One of her nursery maids told us. Eliza blinked. When does she come back? Margaret shrugged. Whenever she wants. Anyway, interrupted Edward, we were wondering whether you wanted to come and see the rest of the house with us. Eliza bit her lip nervously. I don't know. What if somebody sees us? They won't, said Edward. We need a lantern, said Margaret. There's one in the kitchen, said Eliza. I saw it there yesterday. In the flickering glow of the lantern light, they made their way back up to the ground floor and into the main entrance hall. A huge grand staircase wound its way above them, all the way to the top floor. There's a beautiful skylight up there. It's in the shape of an oval. But you can only see it during the day, added Margaret. This is the entrance hall, whispered Edward. Father says it's very important to make good in first impressions. Eliza was already bowled over with a sigh, and she hadn't even seen the rest of the house yet. She peered upwards again into the dark stairwell. Come and look at the door stopper, whispered Margaret. She took the lantern from her brother and illuminated a brass object on the stone floor in the shape of a pineapple. Mother said that the pineapple is a symbol of hospitality. Eliza grinned nervously. W what's hosp hospitality? It's when you invite people into your home, like family and friends. We didn't have many people visiting our house, said Eliza. It was very small. Edward tipped it over to a door at the f foot of the stairs and gently put his ear to it. He listened for a few moments. They're asleep, he hissed. I can hear snoring. That's our parents' room, said Margaret. Eliza gulped. Are you sure they won't wake up? she asked. Pretty sure, replied Margaret. The dining room is next door. Come and see it. The dining room was unlike anything she had ever seen. In the centre was a long table with eight chairs, one at either end. 
Around the walls, portraits stared back at her of old family members and ancestors. Against the wall to their left was a large dresser, and set into it the opposite wall were two deep recessed windows. Eliza was speechless. Do they really eat in here? she asked. Margaret nodded. All the time, except for breakfast. They usually eat that in their bedroom. I sometimes eat on the floor, said Eliza. That's awful, exclaimed Margaret. It sounds like you were treated dreadfully. No, my mummy was very good to me. I love my mummy. We just didn't have any money. Margaret went over to the dresser and opened one of two beautifully carved boxes. Inside was a range of silver cutlery utensils, which glistened in the lamplight. Eliza gazed at them as if temporarily hypnotised. Margaret then opened the cupboards beneath and showed Eliza the glasses they used. What are these? she asked, pointing to a series of glass bowls. These are what they rinse the glasses in during the meal, when they change their drinks. I understand that. We used the same cups as well. We only had a few. Father says the glasses are still taxed since the war against Napoleon. Eliza stared blankly at her. I don't understand, she said. Which part? asked Margaret. Eliza shrugged. Any of it. They reuse the glasses, because glass is taxed. Tax is the money that King George uses to pay for the war against Napoleon. Who's Napoleon? A bad man, whispered Edward. Father said he was an enemy of this country. Margaret pulled out a chair. Sit down, she said to Eliza. Eliza grinned and sat in the chair. Margaret clicked her fingers. Butler! Edward scuttled over. What would you like for your first course, madam? Eliza grinned still more. Oysters, she said. And for your main course? More oysters, she replied. Margaret started to laugh out loud, then quickly stopped herself. Soon they made their way up to the first floor. The doors leading off the landing were all closed. Edward opened the door to their right, and they walked into the biggest and grandest room in the house, the drawing room. But at that moment it didn't look terribly grand at all. The floor and furniture were covered in dust sheets, making the place look somehow eerie and deserted. The covered furniture looked like shadowy tombstones in a churchyard. Eliza shuddered. I don't like it in here, she said. Don't be silly, said Margaret. When they're not in using this room, they cover it all up to keep everything looking nice. We're a very important family, said Edward. Everything in our house has to look perfect for our guests, otherwise it's bad for father's reputation. What do they use this room for? asked Eliza. For entertaining. They dance, play music and cards, recite poetry and promenade. That's why this room is so big. Promenade? asked Eliza, frowning. Show her, Margaret, said Edward. Margaret began to stroll around the room, flicking her nightdress in spectacular fashion. This is promenading, she said. It's what the ladies do to show off their dresses. Eliza laughed. She began to do the same, and before long the two little girls were promenading around the room together, flicking their dresses and giggling. Margaret came to a halt suddenly in front of one of the ghostly shapes. This is the piano, she said. She lifted back a corner of the dust cover to show her. I'm learning how to play this. I have lessons every day. Mother says it will help me to impress any suitors when I'm older. What's a suitor? asked Eliza. Somebody who wants to marry you. I wish my mother had married a different suitor than my father, said Eliza. Then I wouldn't be here. It was at that moment that the door to the drawing room creaked open. Mr. Gilmore, having just returned late from a dinner, was confused to hear the sound of laughter coming from upstairs. He was now positively furious to find his two youngest children fraternising with a new scullery maid in the drawing room. Edward nearly dropped the lantern in fright when he saw his father. What in the name of thunder are you doing in here? he bellowed. You will return to the nursery this instant. Edward and Margaret rushed from the room and fled up the remaining stairs. Mr. Gilmore followed them across the landing. You two should know better, he shouted. He turned back to Eliza. Come here. Trembling, Eliza walked forward and stood before him. Your place, young lady, is below stairs, so I suggest you get yourself back down there immediately. I shall be speaking to Mrs. Scrimger about this in the morning. Eliza returned to the basement, taking the lantern with her. Fresh, salty tears ran down her face as she replaced the lantern on the windowsill above the grill and went back to her room. She was still sobbing quietly as she fell asleep.
The following morning she rose reluctantly and dressed before going to the kitchen. Mrs. Scrimger hadn't emerged yet. The large clock on the wall told her it was still only ten to six. She decided to try and impress the cook by getting the fire lit and the water heated all by herself. She dragged one of the wicker coal baskets out from under the table and began filling up the range. She suddenly heard a door open close by, and Mrs. Scrimger appeared a moment later. "'Bless me, you're up early,' she said. "'Did you sleep all right?' Eliza flung her arms around the cook's expansive waist and burst into tears. Mrs. Scrimger immediately crouched down. "'Hey, what's all this?' she said, drying Eliza's eyes with a little hanky. "'I'm sorry, I'm sorry,' she wailed. "'What are you sorry about?' asked the cook gently. "'If you've broken something, it can easily be replaced.' Eliza shook her head. It's not that, she said. Then what? At nine o'clock, Mr. Gilmore sent a message downstairs that Mrs. Scrimger was to come to the dining room. When she returned ten minutes later, she called Eliza to her side. I've sorted things out, she said, but you mustn't ever do that again. Do you understand? Eliza nodded vigorously. Mrs. Scrimger gave her a hug. Cheer up. It's not the end of the world. Hey, do you know what today is? Thursday, replied Eliza. Mrs. Scrimger laughed. It's All Saints Day, she said. Eliza frowned. All Saints Day, or the Feast of All Saints, is a feast in honour of all the saints who have reached heaven, saints both known and unknown. It dates back to the year 609, when Pope Boniface IV consecrated the Pantheon at Rome to the Blessed Virgin. Mrs. Scrimger laughed at the little girl's expression of complete bewilderment. Never mind. I'll explain it to you later. All you need to know is, we have a big day ahead of us. We have to prepare a large dinner for the Gilmores this evening, and we have permission to hold our own celebrations. It was indeed a very big day, with two meals to prepare, one of them for the servants. Eliza was kept busy almost every minute, preparing vegetables, fetching and carrying for the cook, plucking the pheasants, skinning and gutting the rabbits, which she did under careful instruction from Mrs. Scrimger and polishing the trays that the food would eventually be placed on. She also got to watch the preparation of the jellies. At five o'clock she laid the table in the servants' hall. She was even allowed to lay a place for herself this time. The fire had been lit an hour before so as to ensure the room was warm, and all she had to do was stoke it a little and place candles on the mantelpiece and in the centre of the table. At half past five the staff took their places. Before the meal began, Mrs. Scrimger led them all in a hymn that was traditionally sung on All Saints' Day. Eliza enjoyed herself immensely. It was the first time in her life that she had ever had so much to eat. By half past six, the Gilmore's first guests were arriving, and Mr. Crookshank excused himself. Eliza watched the guests arrive through the window in the servants' hall, women in silk dresses, dismounting from their carriage, gentlemen with bundles of billowing material around their throats. Mr. Crookshank had hired several casual waiters who had been milling all around all afternoon. Mrs. Scrimger had prepared the oysters they had bought the previous day, which now went up to the drawing room. They were nearing the end of their meal, when Mr. Gilmore suddenly appeared in the doorway. Everybody immediately stood up. His face was sombre. Excuse me for disturbing you, he began. Mrs. Scrimger, I wonder if I might have a word with yourself and Eliza outside. Eliza followed the cook and Mr. Gilmore into the kitchen passage. At the foot of the stairs stood a strange gentleman. He wore a long black cape with a high collar that scratched the bottom of his beard. Eliza, this is Mr. Porteous, a minister from the old town. I'm afraid he has some bad news for you. Mr. Porteous stepped forward into the lamplight. Hello, Eliza. I am the minister from your old parish. I visited your mother and yourself a couple of times in the past. Eliza, I regret to inform you that yesterday afternoon your mother passed away. I'm truly sorry. Mrs. Scrimger put her hands gently on Eliza's shoulders. I don't understand, said Eliza. Mr. Porteous cleared his throat. Your mother is dead, he said awkwardly. Eliza's heart began to pound hard and fast, and her little cheeks flushed with colour. How did? she began. If she wasn't well, said Mr. Porteous. Mrs. Scrimger noticed the quick glance between the two gentlemen. Eliza buried her face in the cook's dress. Mrs. Scrimger took the little girl into the kitchen, sat down in one of the chairs, 
and took Eliza onto her lap. For the next ten minutes or so, they stayed in that little corner of the kitchen, Mrs. Scrimger's shawl soaking up the tears. But Mrs. Scrimger had her duties to attend to. Eliza went over to the range and sat down on the little footstool to gaze into the glowing coals. The heat from the fire was comforting. All at once she did something she had not done since she left school. She clasped her trembling hands and prayed. She prayed to all the saints that they would take care of her mother now. For the next two weeks Eliza walked around in what seemed like a dream world. She hardly spoke to anybody. She kept her head down and got on with her duties. She lost interest in her food. Mrs. Scrimger fretted and grieved for her, but any attempts to cheer her up were all in vain. Jessie continued to teach her to read. You're coming on really well, she said to her one evening as they sat on her bed. Your mother would be very impressed. It was the wrong thing to say. Eliza burst into tears. Jessie put her arms around her pupil. I'm sorry, sweetheart, she said. The tears began to block the chalk on the slate. This is stupid, said Eliza. What's the point in me learning anything? Because it will give you a better chance in life, darling. If you're educated, you can work in better jobs. People will have more respect for you. There are many clever people in Edinburgh, Eliza. You could become one of them. One day, at the end of the two weeks, a strange woman appeared at the servant's entrance. Mrs. Scrimger introduced her as Miss Murray, who was to take over the post of cook. Eliza disliked her on sight, and vice versa. Miss Murray was a stern, unsmiling woman in her late thirties, who had no time for scullery maids. She looked down at Eliza with complete disdain. How old? Eliza is ten, replied Mrs. Scrimger. How long has she been here? Eliza has been with us for about three weeks. I hope she has had prior experience. None, replied Mrs. Scrimger. Miss Murray rolled her eyes. That's quite unsatisfactory, she said. Any discovery maid who knows what she's doing, and not one that has to be mollycoddled. What does that mean? asked Eliza. Miss Murray's eyes widened. You will speak when you are spoken to, and not at any other time. Is that understood? Eliza scowled at her. Her manners better have improved when I return in a week, she said. A week, thought Eliza. After that, Mrs. Scrimger will no longer be here. Instead, this frightful woman will have taken her place. The week passed in misery. With each day that disappeared, so did a part of Eliza. She felt like lying down in a corner and giving up. On her last evening, Mrs. Scrimger seemed as sad as the little girl. Eliza didn't want to leave her side. At one point she held on to Mrs. Scrimger and begged her not to go. It was all the cook could do to keep from breaking down in tears. I don't want to leave either, my sweet, but I have to. My health is not what it used to be. But I could come with you. I could help you. Mrs. Scrimger now wiped a tear from her eye and shook her head. That's not possible, sweetheart, she said sadly. The next morning, Eliza watched Mrs. Scrimger climb into a carriage and disappear from view. Tears streamed down the little girl's cheeks as she held Jessie's hand. I'll never see it again, she sobbed. Suddenly, emerging round the corner was Miss Murray, a large bag in hand, strolling purposefully towards them. Eliza hid her face in Jessie's skirt. The first day under the new cook's regime was an awful experience for poor Eliza. Miss Murray bullied and belittled her. When she cried, she was chastised for making too much noise. She was used like a slave by Miss Murray, who probably considered that she was little less than at anyway. For supper, she was given half rations for spilling a bucket of water. Eliza went to bed in an empty stomach and an even emptier soul. The next morning she was rudely awoken by the cook, who insisted that she should be up by now and lighting the fire. I can't abide lazy scullery maids, she snapped. She's not lazy, said Jessie, almost under her breath. Miss Murray gave her a look that would have withered a flower. I beg your pardon, Jessie said nothing more. I will not have you correcting what I say, thank you very much. Eliza hurriedly changed and went into the kitchen. The second day was hardly better than the first. In the afternoon she sat with Jessie in her bedroom. Jessie was now her rock the person she could rely on for support now that Mrs. Skimger had gone. Jessie smiled to herself now as she wrote a sentence on the slate for Eliza to decipher. The first word Eliza got immediately. The. New. Cook. Jessie nodded. 
Well done. Keep going. Ez. Ah. Uh, Eliza frowned. What's this word? She asked. Jesse grinned. N A. What sound does that make? Na. And S T Y. Sti. Replied Eliza. Sure. So put the two together. Nasty. Said Eliza, grinning broadly. Then she read the whole sentence. The new cook is a nasty woman. They both giggled. What on earth is going on in here? Miss Murray had suddenly appeared in the doorway. I'm teaching Eliza to read, said Jessie. Are you indeed? Well, Eliza has duties to attend to. Eliza had started to rub away the chalk lettering. In the next moment, Miss Murray had strolled forward and snatched it out of her hands. Go to the kitchen at once, she barked. Eliza left the room, trembling. Miss Murray absent-mindedly glanced at the slate before doing a double-take. Jessie bit her lip. Eliza's last glimpse of Jessie was at the tradesman's entrance, with a shawl around her shoulders and a canvas bag in her hand. Eliza couldn't take it any more. She flew up the stairs into the main house and rushed up to the first floor. She heard voices coming from the parlour and burst through the door. Miss and Mrs. Gilmore looked round abruptly at the distressed little figure that had so suddenly appeared. "'You can't send Jessie away!' she screamed. "'What the devil!' began Mr. Gilmore. "'She's done nothing wrong. Miss Murray is the one who should be sending away.' "'How dare you!' shouted Mr. Gilmore. "'Get out of here at once! I'm not going anywhere until you—' Miss Murray appeared in the doorway, looking flustered. "'Eliza!' she yelled. She grabbed the little girl by the wrist and dragged her from the room. She escorted the struggling scullery maid downstairs and out to the meat shed. I've had enough of you, little miss. You can cool that foul temper of yours in here. She shoved her into the shed and locked the door. Eliza immediately banged on the other side. I hate you, she shrieked. You're a cruel, horrible woman. Then you can stay in there all night, shouted the cook. It was not a casual remark. Hours later, and shivering with cold, Eliza watched the patch of daylight that had filtered in under the door fade to nothing. She huddled herself into a corner and wrapped her little arms around her for warmth. I've been abandoned, she thought. My mother's gone, Mrs. Scrimger's gone, and now Jessie. Only Agnes and Mr. Crookshank were left. Surely that was not enough to run a household properly. The smell of dead animals wafted around her in the dark. She shivered again, but not from cold. Suddenly she heard footsteps approaching the shed. She stood up. A key turned in the lock, and the door creaked open. Mr. Crookshank's face glowed in the light from a lantern. Eliza's own face broke into an automatic smile. He put a finger to his lips. Miss Murray doesn't know I'm out here. I brought you a blanket and some food. I'll leave you this lantern as well. He came in and closed the door behind him. You'll get into trouble, says Eliza. No, I won't, he replied with a wink. I'm doing Mrs. Gilmore a favour. It's in her interest to make sure you're healthy. Eliza perched on the edge of the marble slab and sighed heavily. You're the only one left who's really thinking about me, she said. Mrs. Scrimger left me. I thought she liked me. I pleaded with her to take me away from here, but she didn't. Mr. Crookshank sat down next to her on the slab. He removed a piece of paper from his pocket. I happened to find this under Mrs. Scrimger's bed. It's a note to her from Mrs. Gilmore. I thought it might be of interest to you. You can read a little now, can't you? Eliza nodded. Very well, then. He rose. I should be getting back now. He placed the rug he had brought for her in the corner where she'd been sitting and carefully placed three slices of bread and cheese on top of it. It was all I could find, I'm afraid. Eliza shrugged and smiled. It's fine. Thank you. Mr. Crookshank chuckled and reached into his pocket again. This time he produced a little parcel wrapped in cloth. I managed to procure a large slice of ham from the servant's table. He gave her a wink as he handed it over. Enjoy, he said. He left her the lantern and closed the shed door again, but she didn't hear the key in the lock this time. In the light of the lantern, Eliza began slowly to read the note Mr. Crookshank had given her. Dear Mrs. Scrimger, I have thought about your request, and although I understand your feelings for Eliza, I regret that I cannot let her go. I need her here. I cannot wait for another one to come along. Please do not suppose that I am dismissive of your daughter's feelings or either. I fully understand her desire to adopt Liza, and it is very noble of her. 
I wish you happiness in your new life at Port Seton. With kind regards, Helen Gilmore. Eliza's eyes grew wide as she read. Although she didn't understand some of the words, she understood enough. Mrs. Scrimger had wanted to take her with her. It had not been her intention to abandon her. Eliza's heart leapt. Her dear Mrs. Scrimger. She had to go to her. She had to escape from this place. But how? Even if she escaped from the house, she had no money for a carriage, and she had no idea or how far Port Seton was from here, so walking wasn't an option. But then she didn't have many options, nor did she have any, any chances. Suddenly she remembered. She looked up at the door. He hadn't locked it. There was no time and no point in thinking about money now. This was her chance to get out of here. She picked up the food and shoved it into her pocket, along with the note and wrapped the rug around her for warmth. She pushed open the shed door and headed away down the back drive. Her little heart was pounding so furiously that she thought it might explode. She had no idea where she was going. Her only thought at that moment was to get as far away from the house as possible. She had no notion of time, only that it was late at night and a long time until morning. She would have to find somewhere to sleep. She woke with the crack of dawn in a doorway. She'd eaten most of her food the night before, but there was still a piece of bread left. She retrieved it from her pocket now and munched hungrily on it as she watched a cat cleaning itself on the other side of the street. As more people began to appear, she thought it best to get them moving. She thought about a plan of action while eating her bread. She'd try and find a sympathetic coach driver who would take her to Port Seton. After only two attempts at this, she gave up. Both drivers had told her to scarf her. She wandered dejectedly along the pavement, trying to think of another idea. The morning passed with no luck. She was getting hungry again, and the rug was filthy now from the dragging in the dirt. By two o'clock she was very tired and very hungry, not to mention dreadfully unhappy. Was this how she was going to end up, as a street urchin, begging for food and pennies? It was not what her mother had envisioned for her. She had tried so hard to help her daughter. Now Eliza felt that she was letting her mother down. But she didn't want to go back to the house and the wrath of Miss Murray. Suddenly Eliza realised that she had left the new town behind and was now at present walking up to the high street. When she got there, her stomach began to rumble as she saw a bread stall ahead of her. She was so hungry by now she could have eaten a horse. Her eyes rested on the fresh loaves. She could already taste them. A customer was busy choosing one as she watched. Once he'd made his decision, he handed his money over to the stallkeeper, who then turned away. Now was her chance. She darted forward and snatched the nearest one to her, then took off at a run. Ah, here we devil! she heard the storekeeper shout. Then she heard a whistle. Out of the corner of her eye she saw Bailey running flat out towards her. She ditched the rug and ran as if for her life. But she was not as fast as the Bailey, and he very quickly gained on her. Suddenly, when he was close enough, he reached out a hand and grabbed her arm. He spun her round. What do you think you're up to, little miss? Stealing bread? He took the loaf off her. Eliza stared up at him, eyes wide with fear. Come along now, he said. Once the loaf had been returned to the stall, Eliza was marched down to the toll booth. Every limb trembled as she entered this grim building, in the firm grip of the policeman. A few minutes later a door opened in front of her to reveal a small, empty cell with grey stone walls and a large pile of straw on the cold stone floor. The place had an odd, unwelcoming smell to it. In you go, said the bailey. She tried to resist, but he pushed her inside and closed the door with a loud thump. She heard the clank of metal. Eliza threw herself down on the straw pile, covered her face with her hands and sobbed. What had she done? She had stolen, but now she was in serious trouble. She had never thought she might end up in a squalid cell in the toll booth, a place where criminals were brought. She was a criminal now. Hours seemed to pass, or well, that's what it felt like. At one point a rat scuttled across the floor a few feet from her and disappeared into a crack in the wall. At another point the flap on the little peephole halfway up the door was drawn back and a blinking eye appeared for a few moments before it was closed again. She shook constantly, lying curled in the fetal position and trying not to contemplate her future. She doubted that there was one for her now. Her mother had always told her that stealing was never an option, no matter how desperate their situation became. 
What would she say if she could see her now? thought Eliza. But her mother was dead. There was no point in thinking like that. Tears fell from her eyes and disappeared to the straw. It was after another half an hour or so had passed that the bolt on the door was drawn back, and Eliza, now in a half-disoriented state, was aware of two figures entering. Is this the girl? There was a pause. Eliza hadn't even bothered to look up. No, said Miss Murray. Are you sure? said the other off voice. Positive, replied Miss Murray, as she turned on her heels. The door slammed shut again. Eliza closed her eyes and lost consciousness. The next thing she was aware of was of being woken by one of the jailers. Come on, young lady, on your feet. You're due in front of the magistrate in five minutes. She was escorted up some stairs into a large wood-panelled hall, at the far end of which was a beautiful mahogany table. Behind it sat the magistrate. He was a frightening-looking man, with a stern face and large hands that rested on the table. He stared at Eliza through dark, piercing eyes. Well, young lady, he said after the charges were read out, what do you have to say for yourself? Eliza was too scared to say anything at all. She stood before the table, locked in his glare. Very well. I can see the only place for you is the workhouse. At least you'll stay out of trouble there. The workhouse. She had heard of that place. When you went in there, you didn't come back out. In there, her mother had told her, you worked all day for your bed and board, and that was your life, until it was over. As she sat in a rickety carriage with bars over the windows, and felt every rumble and jolt through her frail little body, she let go of any hopes she had once possessed of seeing her beloved Mrs. Scrimger ever again. The workhouse looked even grimmer than the toll booth. The carriage passed through a gateway and pulled up in a quadrant. The carriage doors were opened and she was released, only to be taken by the scruff and led through the another door. A minute later she found herself in a small room with a table and two chairs. They waited for a few more minutes in silence before a gentleman entered, looking a little flustered. He looked Eliza over before sitting down at the table. He beckoned her to do the same. He had a sheet of paper and a quill pen. Now, he began, after a heavy sigh, what's your name? Eliza whispered her name to him. Thank you, he said with a smile and wrote it down. What age are you, Eliza? Ten, she whispered. Again, he wrote this on the paper. It looked as though he were filling out a form. And where did you last reside? Reside? whispered Eliza. Where did you last live? I was a scullery maid in the new town. Charlotte Square, I think. And why are you no longer there? he asked. They didn't want me any more. I see. And uh, you have nowhere to live now, is that right? Before Eliza could answer, the officer intervened. She's a street urchin. She was caught stealing bread. The magistrate sent her here. I don't believe the question was addressed to you, sir, said the gentleman. He put down the quill pen and clasped his fingers together. Now listen, he said gently. This is not a prison, despite what some people might think. He flashed a glance at the officer. My name is Mr. Duggan. I am the relieving officer for this establishment, and the reason I am asking you these questions is simply to establish what your circumstances are and whether you really need to be here. Do you understand? Eliza nodded. Good. He picked up his pen again and did some more writing. Do you have any relatives? he asked. My mother died a few weeks ago. I don't know where my father is. This he scribbled down as well. All right, he said after a moment. As you have nowhere to go just now, you can stay in our probationary ward until a decision is reached as to whether or not you can formally enter the workhouse. Mrs. Gilmore stood by the fire, her arms folded. Miss Murray stood in front of her. Did you find her? asked Miss Gilmore. I did not, madam. It was a different girl. Mrs. Gilmore sighed. Would you like to tell me, please, how I am supposed to run an efficient household with only one housemaid and a butler, and how you propose to run a kitchen? Miss Murray took a deep breath. I will hire some more at once. Quite frankly, Miss Murray, you should not have fired my housemaid in the first place, because it is neither your place nor your duty to do such a thing. Miss Murray lowered her eyes. I wasn't aware of that, my lady. I do apologise. You weren't aware of that? repeated Mrs. Gilmore incredulously. How long have you been a cook, Miss Murray? Seven years, my lady. 
Mrs. Gilmore shook her head. And what about shutting my scullery maid in a shed overnight? It was quite disgraceful of you. She sighed again. Do you realise that even if you did advertise, it would take a number of weeks before anybody actually took up a position? I am reluctant to hire too much casual help after last month's theft. Mrs. Gilmore turned towards the fire. At the moment, Miss Murray, you are more trouble than you're worth. She dismissed the cook and stood where she was for a few moments. He wasn't just annoyed at the lack of house staff. She was deeply concerned for Eliza. She thought about Mrs. Scrimger's request. She should have granted it. Eliza sat on a bed in a long room, with many other beds lined up against the walls on either side. The probationary ward was at the very top of the West Wing, a separate building for women and children. As Eliza sat quietly on her own, she observed a woman making her own way down the ward towards her, carrying a box. She picked her way through a gaggle of children who were playing with the wooden toys on the floor, and nodded to a young woman who sat hunched on, on another bed. As the woman drew closer, she smiled at Eliza. Hello, I'm the medical officer. I'm come to see you. After a fairly cursory examination, the medical officer concluded that the only thing her patient was suffering from was a lack of love, and at this precise moment, a lack of food. When did you last eat? she asked. This morning, but it was only a piece of bread. Well, dinner will be brought up in a minute. It's bacon and vegetables tonight. Eliza smiled. It wasn't too bad in here after all. The next morning, Eliza ate a breakfast of porridge and bread. The girl in the bed next to her introduced herself as Becky. She had a funny accent. Where are you from? asked Eliza. Ireland, said Becky. Where's that? asked Eliza curiously. It's over the sea. They came in a big boat. I got sick. My mother did too. She didn't get better. She lowered her eyes and went back to eating her porridge. There wasn't much to do in the ward, other than lie on a bed. In the afternoon, however, they went out for a walk with some of the staff. It was not exactly the most exciting walk, but it passed the time and got some air into them, fresh or otherwise. Becky shuffled along beside her, keeping her eyes on the pavement. She was very quiet, only saying anything when somebody addressed her directly. That evening before dinner, all those in the probationary ward were required to attend prayer in the dining hall. It was the first time Eliza had seen the workhouse proper. The dining hall was furnished with four long tables and benches side by side, with a single smaller table at the end of the hall for the governor and matron. The governor stood while they delivered prayer, which lasted perhaps only fifteen minutes, after which he said grace and the meal began. It was at this point that Eliza and the other probationers were escorted back to the ward, where their own dinner of pork and peas pudding was waiting for them. Becky took her portion back to her bed and balanced the plate on her lap. Can I sit next to you? asked Eliza. Becky nodded, her mouth full of food. How old are you? asked Eliza. Ten, replied Becky. I'm ten as well. She ate a little bit of pudding. Can I be your friend? she asked sheepishly, as though she were expecting the answer to be no. Becky smiled. I thought you already were, she said. The next morning Eliza was told that the matron wanted to see her. She was taken back to the little room where she'd been when she first arrived. The matron was already waiting for her. Good morning, Eliza. Good morning, ma'am, replied Eliza quietly. Eliza, I have called you here this morning to tell you that, as of today, you are formally a member of the workhouse. Congratulations. Eliza, though, wasn't sure whether to be happy or sad about this. She managed a little smile. Thank you, she whispered. Now, there are several things we need to do, so if you want to come with me now, we can get started. Eliza followed the matron to the washrooms, where she was stripped of her clothes and bathed thoroughly in a large cast-iron tub of warm water. It was the first time in a long time that Eliza had been in a bath. She loved it. Loved the sensation of being surrounded by hot water. By the time she stepped out of the tub, a fresh workhouse uniform had been brought for her, and her own clothes had been taken away to be washed and disinfected. After her hair was combed, the matron escorted her to a large room, where Eliza was confronted by a sea of white linen. Women and children sat at tables with the linen spread out in front of them, where they appeared to be mending tears in the material. Do you know how to sew, Eliza? She nodded. She had mended clothes when she had lived with her mother. I'll start you on the uniforms. They'll be easier to handle. Will Becky get a place in the workhouse? Eliza asked. 
The matron frowned. Becky, she repeated. The Irish girl. Recognition dawned. I don't know, she said. That's up to the board. What's the board? The board are a group of trustees who are responsible for making decisions about the workhouse. They decide who gets a place and who doesn't. Eliza was put with a girl a few years older than her, called Annie. How long have you been here? asked Eliza. Three years, she replied without smiling. Why did you have to come? Annie didn't reply. Eliza waited for a response. I said, I heard what you said, snapped the girl. I'm not answering any more questions unless it's about her darning. Eliza lowered her head then and gone on with her work. At a quarter past twelve, they got half an hour for lunch, which was soup, bread and cheese. It was quiet in the dining hall. Not many people spoke. They were all too busy feeding themselves. Annie was at a different table from her. Three years, thought Eliza. No wonder she was grumpy. I wonder how long I'm going to be here for. The governor rose and said grace again, which signified the end of lunch. Two hours later, Eliza's wrist was beginning to ache from sewing so much. She watched Annie out of the corner of her eye, watched how she did it. She was much faster, her fingers moving skillfully. Is your wrist not sore by now? she asked. It's not too bad, she said, still without smiling. Eliza paused. I'm sorry if I'm annoying you, she said. Annie didn't immediately respond. You're not annoying me, she said eventually. I won't ask any more personal questions. Annie sewed a couple more stitches before she said, I'm here because my mother's dead and my father was thrown in jail for stealing cattle. What's cattle? Cows, replied Annie. When do you think you'll be allowed to leave here? asked Eliza. When my father is leased, maybe another three years. Eliza rose at six o'clock the next morning to face her second day in the workhouse. By seven o'clock she was back in the sewing room. Another long day followed, a day of monotonous routine and more stiff wrists. Dinner could not come soon enough for her, and by the time she retired to bed at eight, her little eyes were so heavy she was asleep before she knew it. A third day followed, and a fourth. Eliza was finding it increasingly difficult to cope with the workload. The sheer dullness of the routine was getting to her. That evening she was in bed by eight o'clock once again. She had lain there, staring up at the ceiling above her head. The image of a smiling Mrs. Scrimger momentarily obscured her vision. She still missed her, still wished she could see her again, even if it was just for five minutes. She wondered if they were allowed visitors in the workhouse. She fell asleep with that question still in her mind. She was woken by a strange sensation, as though the bed were rocking from side to side. She opened her eyes. She was in somebody's arms, a woman. They were in a moving carriage. You're safe, Eliza, said the woman. Everything's all right now. Go back to sleep. It was Mrs. Gilmore. Eliza's heart sank. She was being taken back to the house, back to Miss Murray. She began to shake her head. It's all right, Eliza, she said again. I promise. Go back to sleep. The next thing she knew, she was lying in a bed. At first she assumed she was in that little closet bedroom she shared with the housemaids. Her rag doll lay next to her. But she suddenly became aware that the pillow on which her head was resting was a lot bigger than the one she was used to. It smelt different too. Eliza slowly sat up and looked around her. And there she was, sitting in a chair by the bed. Her dear Mrs. Scrimger. Eliza shrieked and leapt from the bed straight into the old woman's arms. Mrs. Scrimger exclaimed good-naturedly as the little girl landed on top of her. Hello, my sweet, she said. When Eliza finally let her go of her, Mrs. Scrimger said, I want you to meet somebody. They left the bedroom and immediately found themselves in the kitchen. A young woman was standing over the stove. She looked round when they entered. Eliza, I'd like you to meet my daughter, Arabella. Arabella came forward and politely extended her hand. Eliza took it with a smile. It's a pleasure to meet you, Eliza, she said. Arabella's going to look after you from now, said Mrs. Scrimger. This is your new home. Eliza smiled again. The front door suddenly opened. Her smile broadened when she saw who stood there. Jessie! 
Jessie dropped to her knees and held out her arms. That was the only invitation Eliza needed. What are you doing here? she asked. I had nowhere else to go, replied Jessie. Six months passed. Eliza had been enrolled in the local school and was doing very well. Every evening before supper, she would do her homework with Jessie. It was during one of these sessions that Jessie asked, What do you want to do when you're older, Eliza? I'm not sure, she said, shrugging her shoulders. Maybe a nurse, so I can help people get better. Jessie nodded, smiling. Good answer. There is one thing I'm sure of, though. What is that? asked Jessie. I don't ever want to be a scullery maid again. <laughs>